Well, amen, amen. Good morning again, church. Take your Bibles if you brought them with you. Uh, and turn with me, if you would, to Psalms chapter 1. The book of Psalms chapter 1 is where our uh, text is found this morning. There's six verses uh, there in that psalm. Um, the superscript that is above the, the psalm itself uh, in my Bible says, the way of the righteous and the end of of the ungodly, the way of the righteous and the end of the ungodly. I'm going to be talking this morning about a tale of two men, a tale of two men. Psalm chapter 1, verse 1, and the Bible says this, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Lord, I ask now that you would give discernment and understanding of our text that we read today. Lord, that you would give help um, to me as I walk us through, that, Lord, you would give me unction uh, to preach the word, an anointing to preach the word in a way that would honor you, that would edify your people, and that would horrify our enemy. And so, Lord, blessed be your name, for your word is good and it is sure. May you give your blessing to it now in Jesus' name. Amen and amen, a tale of two men. I love preaching in the Psalms because this very issue, often in the very, in, in the very same Psalm, the Bible will give us these great contrasts. And what we find in there is that more often than not, their contrast based upon the choice that man has made about his life or his Lord. In other words, what happens is it kind of in a, really in a large way, it debunks a myth that many seem to, to uh, abide with or, or, or adhere to, that life is just, you know, we're just victim of our circumstances, that, that life's just happened to me, or, you know, I just a a, a, a series of, of, of horrible uh, opportunities that I had. And I didn't really have a choice. And, you know, I'm just here because that's the way that the wind blew. Yet the Bible would give us this glaring picture that uh, your choices make a, an immense difference in how your life plays out. There's a lot of things that are out of our control. And that's certainly the case. But yet you and I are the ones that will decide really, number one, the biggest picture, our eternity and how we respond to the, uh, the, the, the old preachers used to call it the wooing of the Holy Spirit, how he woos us, how he draws us to his side. We determine then in our response where our eternity will be. Uh, that's certainly here in our text this morning. But there's also a picture in how our life is lived out that is determined by our choice, our decision. Now, there is a, 
a whole wave of folks today that uh, I'm not going to get into where they are. I don't. I disagree with them, but they have this belief set that says that we're just, you know, we're just kind of out here living. God's decided how it's all going to go, and uh, you just you just can't help it. You're, you, you, you don't really have free will. The, the problem I have with that is the, the Bible has a problem with that. We have a free will, a choice in which we make. And so I want to walk us through and I want to show you this contrast that he gives us uh, of the man who is blessed that he calls the godly man and the man who he calls the ungodly or the unrighteous and his end. Three things I want to mention about the godly man. And number one, I want to mention to you about how he separates. Number two, of how he marinates. And number three, about how he situates. Number one, I want you to look there in verse one, how he separates. Now, I'm just going to give you fair warning this morning. I'm going to get myself in trouble a little bit. Well, why are you going to get yourself in trouble? Because I'm going to say some things this morning that the Lord's put on my heart that will not be popular uh, with some. I'm, I'm prefacing that to say I'm not saying that to fuss with anybody today. I'm not saying what I'm saying uh, to be popular or to win friends. I'm saying what I'm saying to you today because God has called me to be the under-shepherd of this church. Well, what does a shepherd do? A shepherd gives guidance. A shepherd gives leadership. But sometimes a shepherd gives warning. Now, the warning part is not the fun part for me. Uh, the warning part is not that part where uh, you just with great glee and gladness say, isn't that fun to be warned like that? Nobody really wants to be warned. Warnings are not fun, right? You, you buy a new chainsaw. It's got warning stickers all over it. You don't read those things. First thing you do is rip them off, right? Uh, then it rips your leg off, amen. It, the warnings are there because they matter. They keep us uh, from certain destruction. This first part here in verse one really is a, a warning, if you will, to uh, the man or the woman of God who's desi desired to follow him. The other two are positive. This first one is in the negative. And it's how we separate. Over in chapter uh, 6 of 2 Corinthians, verse 17 says, to come ye out from among them and be ye separate, says the Lord. Come ye out from among them and be ye separate, says the Lord. Now, this again, this is not a... a, a it's not a fun doctrine. It's not even a popular doctrine uh, that you'll hear anymore. And it's called the doctrine of separation, whereby we have a separate life from that of the world. Our life should, you can say amen there. You may not say it here in a minute, uh, but, but we, our life should really be a separate picture from that of those who have rejected God uh, as the Lord of their life. But he, he noticed, I want you to notice here in verse one, he gives us a three-tiered uh, decline of the man uh, that has rejected God. He said, blessed is the man who, here it is, number one, walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. Number two, he, he, he stands not in the path of the sinner, nor does he sit in the seat of the scornful. I, I want you to hear me. Whenever you live a life that rejects God, you don't just do that on a level playing field. It'll always take you further down the hill than where you started at. In other words, it, it, it's a decline that will get you worse and worse and further and further away from God. The first one he talked about is the ungodly. This is just a group of people that don't have really any need for God. They don't have any room in their life for God. And he said, here's what the blessed man does. He does not walk in the counsel of them. He separated himself in such a way that he's not listening to their advice. He's not following in their path. He does that in the second one. He doesn't stand in the path of sinners. The sinners are those who are just outright rejecting God. First group just didn't have a need for it. The sinner is the one who's rejecting God. I, I'm, I hear you. But I'm not following that path. I'm not going to do that. And he said, this is the blessed man. He's not going to be found in that path. Number one, he's disassociating from the ungodly, but he's not going to be found walking the path of the sinner. And the last one is he doesn't sit in the seat of the scornful. 
One, he's walking. The other, he's taking a stand. The last one, he's setting. And all of this is to give you this picture. The end result of it is you've taken up residence seated with the scornful, which are atheists. It's those who mock God. It's those who, who don't just not have a need for him, but they're anti-God now. Now, uh, here's the part where I'm going to give you a warning. This is, this is <laughs> I've, I've debated on whether or not to even bring it up, but I'm just, I love you too much to not give a warning. We're ha- about to have one of the most significant moments in the life of our nation that's coming up here in a couple of weeks. And that's our election that comes around every four years. You say, are you about to endorse somebody? No, I never have from this pulpit. I never will. That's not what I'm going to do. But I am going to stand here today not to endorse a party, but to give you a warning about a party. Now, before I give that, let me give a warning. There's corruption everywhere in our political system. This is the reason that we don't hitch ourselves to a political party. And the reason why is because we reserve the right as the people of God to speak into both parties uh, whenever they err. All right? Now, often what Christians have done is they've hitched themselves to the Republican Party. I would warn you uh, against that. And the reason why is because they're selling out as fast as they possibly can right now. The things that they have stood strong for for so long, they are weakening on. One of those is abortion. I'm an abolitionist on abortion. I don't think that there's a place for abortion anywhere in the life of the believer. There was a time whenever, just across the board, you'd find a Republican standing strong on that. Listen to me. I'm telling you, they're caving, and they're caving for expediency. We want to get elected. I knew it was going to be quiet but they're doing it. And so, so many of us have, have been this, this one issue voter for so long, which we've been getting a lot of flack from. Don't be that one issue voter. I get that. But they're saying, well, abortion's a big enough deal. Well, what are we going to do when they've all caved on that issue? Well, that's where I'm coming to give you warning. Because the warning here fits in our text of these that are ungodly. They don't need God. We just don't have room for him. The, 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 the sinner, we were rejecting him, and the scornful that we're at a place to where we're now mocking God. Now, I want you to hear me, at just because I love you, to give a warning. We have a party in our nation who is openly mocking God. We do have that. Now, again, I told you I'm not coming to give an endorsement. I'm coming to give a warning. This one party has mocked God. Just this last week, uh, our vice president stands up at a rally and somebody stands up and shouts, Jesus is the Lord. And she stops in the middle of that rally and looks at him and says, you are in the wrong rally. They are mocking God. We have one party in our nation, listen to me, that has pushed upon us the the agenda of the homosexuals, one party that has pushed on to us the agenda of the trans, of the, the, what are they, the he, she's, what are they called? Transgenders, we have one party that has crammed us down. Everything that the Bible abhors that is evil and wicked, and yet they have embraced it full-throated, open endorsement. And here's what I'm telling you. Beware to not walk, listen to it again, to not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, those that have no need for it, those that would openly mock God, those that have no place in their life for God, please, I'm begging of you, don't hitch your wagon to those who hate your God. Church, I hope you'll take heed to what I'm saying rather than just fume at me for daring to get near this subject. My goal in this is, number one, I want you to be engaged. Don't go stick your head in the sand and retreat from the public square. We need to be engaged. From elections from the school board all the way to the White House, we can't be a people who just sit back and say, gosh, it just doesn't matter. No, your voice does matter. But your voice cannot, listen to me, it cannot follow those of the ungodly, the sinner, and the scornful. We can't just trumpet that because your mom and dad trumpeted that. 
And so often what's happened in our nation is because, well, mom and dad was a part of this party and I'll be a part of that party till I die. Yet the Bible would tell you, you cannot be connected with them. You can't hitch your wagon to that. Why? Because they hate your God, that's why. They hate your God. The second one, boy, wasn't that popular? That's how they separate. Our life is different. Our life, our morals, the way we treat others, it's different. Come ye out from among them and be ye separate. That's how they separate. Number two is how they marinate. I love this. You know I love this word, marinate, right? Isn't that a good word? It says in the text in verse two, his delight is in the law of the Lord and daily uh, it says that he, he meditates in it day and night. Now, I'm using the word marinate because you get all silly when we talk about meditate. That, that has nothing to do with yoga or Eastern you know, practices or anything like that. But the word marinate fits here, and here's why. It's, it's the, the, the soaking in of something. You go to, you to make a, a steak. Matter of fact, we did this for our guys last week. And you take that steak and you put it in a tub uh, or a chicken bucket or something, right? And, and you, you pour that marinate in there. And before long, after it's set in it and it's soaked in it, whenever you cut, you can wipe it clean off. But when you cut that thing, it bleeds that marinate. Why? Because it's got up in it. Amen. It just, oh, praise God. And it just juicy everywhere. It just, it's just coming out of you, right? Well, well listen, listen to this idea. He said his delight where he finds joy and pleasure is in, listen to the law of the Lord. What is that? That's the word of God. That's the word of God. And he said he meditates. He's marinating in this thing day and night. He, 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 he's, he's giving himself to this. Now, the, here's why that's connected with the first one. That, that helps me to live a life of that first one. Why? Because if I'm marinating in this, then guess what? When I'm confronted with these issues, like our divided nations being confronted right now, what do we think about abortion? What, what do we think about issues like that? What do we think about how we deal with, with the poor? The Bible has a lot to say about how a man treats the poor. Well, well what do we think about uh, the, the, this thing now that, that has uh, uh, become just normal in our society, yet God calls it an abomination, which is homosexuality? What, what do we think of that? Well, can I just tell you, I don't care what you think of it. I care what God thinks of it. You see, I'm not looking to Washington to find my morals. I'm not looking to a, a president to find and, and give my children an example. I hear people say that. Well, I can't, I can't vote for Trump because he's a bad example to my kids. First of all, if you're pointing your children towards Trump or, or towards Kamala or, or anybody else to find an example of godliness, shame on you. You, mom and dad, are the example to your children of what godliness is. I, we're not voting for a, a, a pastor. We're voting for a president. The Bible informs me in how I live. The Bible informs me in how I vote. The Bible informs me on where I draw the line. And I can't go any further than this right here. He, he meditates on He's marinating in it day and night. So when these issues come up, that's just what comes out. of It's the Bible. It's not our opinions because we can, and I, I'm, please don't say amen here. I'm weird. Um, oh, you're Pentecostals now, aren't you? Amen. I'm weird. I like politics. I do. I've always been fascinated by it. I'm fascinated with the whole political system. Uh, now, again, I'm getting less and less fascinated by it because I think that they're just corrupt. I mean, I think we, if we could hit a reset and just start completely over, it'd be a good thing, but it's not happening. Um, I think it's good for us to engage one another in the things that we disagree on rather than divide and just, you know, run out the door and let's go tweet about one another. Um, I, I think it's good for us to, to have dialogue about that. But in doing so, Let's not just share our collective stupidity and our collective ignorance 
Let's stand up and be bold men and women of God and say, here's what God says about this. Here's, here's what our, our society is looking for a people that believe and trust God enough that we could stand up with some conviction, with some steel in our spine and says, listen, I understand this is where our culture is going. I understand that you're passionate about this. And I understand with what I'm about to say, you're probably going to act like a nut. But God says no. We need those people. And if you're not, listen to me, ma'am, sir, if you're not in and marinating in the word of God, you're not going to have the spine to do it. Because it takes, I'm telling you, it takes some spine to do it. Because you're going to offend people. The last one is how he situates himself there in verse 3. It says, he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. When I say situates, it's that he's situated in the place of blessing and fulfillment and nourishment. This is what God's describing through the psalmist. This is the godly man. The godly man is situated, he says, he's like the tree planted by the river. He, he, that, that river is what gives nutrients. That river is what gives it life. That river is what gives it health. And he says, if this man will separate himself from the world, if this man will saturate himself with the word of God, I'm flat telling you, he'll be like the one who has every need in his life met. He'll be like the one who is flourishing in this life. He'll be like the one that is not tossed to and fro. He'll be like the oak that is planted strong and he'll continue to be strong. Why? Because he's getting everything he needs, not from a world that is corrupt, not from a world that is falling, but from a God who never fails, a God who never changes, a God who is has always been and will always be seated upon his throne. This is the man of God. He said, you'll be situated next to that which gives you life. And that is a person, and the person is Jesus. Well, let me, let me close by giving you this portrait of the man you don't want to be. The portrait of the man you want to be is the first three verses. The last three verses, it's a sad commentary. Number one, in verse four, you see that he's a man that has no fruit in his life. The ungodly are not so. In other words, they're not uh, flourishing. They're not so. They're like the chaff which the wind drives away. Do y'all know what chaff is? If you grew up on a farm or anything, did any, you know, like wheat harvest or anything like that, you understand chaff. Or if you've put up hay or anything like that, you understand chaff. It's whenever you, you, you go and, and the, the grains of, of wheat are plucked out of the, the head, there, there's just this, uh, some would call it a fodder. It's just, a, it's just worthless. And, and it, it weighs nothing. And, and when the wind hits it, it just blows wherever. It, this is a picture of the man who is the ungodly, the sinner, and the scoffer. That every wind that comes through, it just, it just blows them. It, 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 it just it blows them over here for a while, and, and this is what we're going to be about. And then it blows them over there for a while, and this is what we're going to be about. And, and, and you see that with the political expediency that's going on in our nation. This is why people flip-flop back and forth. There's no principles in which they stand on. And they do that because it's whatever it takes to hang on to power. Yeah, we said that, and I was really convicted back then, but here's where I am now. Well, well which do you believe? Well, it just depends on what everybody else is believing. Listen to me. The man or woman of God does not go to a, 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 a majority vote to find out what they believe. The vote is one against them all, and it's one which is God. If God says it's good, it's good. If God says it's bad, it's bad. Period. They have no fruit. They're like the chaff, and they blow to and fro. Secondly, they have no faith. 
Verse five, therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. There are many that even use Christianity in an expedient way, in a way that's convenient, that yeah, they'll check that on a box. Why? They want your support, they want your vote, they want to, 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 to sneak in unawares, as, as some would say. They, 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 they don't want to stand for anything, but they sure would like the benefit of it. They have no faith. We learned this in our small group this morning. Without faith, you can't please God. Without faith, you can't walk with God. Without faith, you can't know God. He said, this is the picture of the ungodly. Here's the very last one, and we're done. They have no future. Amen, sissy. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous. The Lord knows the way of the righteous. But listen to this. But the way of the ungodly shall perish. Shall perish. The Hebrew word there is, is abad, which means lost. They are lost. This ungodly, this one that has no faith, has no fruit. The Bible says they have also no future. Why? They're lost. They don't have any hope. The only thing they've got is here and now. That's why they love power. By the way, that's not a political statement. That's, that's mankind. We love power. We want to control things. The further away from God you get, the more control you need. But yet you can't find it. You grasp for it, but you can't get it. Why? Because you understand this life is all you have. But what Jesus is offering to us is a life that transcends this life, a life that is beyond this life, a life that is greater and sweeter and better and, 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 and a life that is fulfilling, a life that gives hope, a life in a place that there's, there's no more politics. There'll be no... There will be no Democrats in heaven. Y'all hearing me? There will be no Republicans in heaven. There will be no independents in heaven. There will only be dependents in heaven. Those who have depended upon the blood of Jesus Christ for their hope. It's a tale of two men. One has chosen the way of Christ. Not the way of the world, not the way of, of, of where culture is, says, no, this is, this, is, this is what you should believe. Culture, culture will tell you, well, you're, you're just, you're antiquated, you're outdated. Listen to me, the word of God is not old, it's not antiquated, it is timeless. It is written by a timeless God, not constrained by our calendar. It doesn't come in and out like your bell bottoms did. Praise God, I hope they don't come back. There's so many things that just come in and out and they're so big that it's everybody's doing that, right? And that may be fine with some of the things that you, you dress like. Paris Hilton made you women all look like bugs. You've got sunglasses that's the size of saucer plates. And then it, it, it goes. But he, hear me. If your faith is on that, he, he's describing you. You'll have no fruit. You'll be like the chaff blown to and fro. Choose today. Not to live as a victim of, of our culture, but as a victor with your eyes squarely fixed and focused on Jesus, the Redeemer, the Messiah, the one who is offering to you forgiveness and eternal life.